Hey there students and welcome back to Intensive Review. In this segment we're going to tackle both USHC 2.3 and 2.4. So we're going to take a quick look at sectionalism and antebellum reform. All right, just uh, knock these both out in a single segment. So first of all, we need to note what is antebellum. Antebellum is a Latin word meaning before the Civil War. Starts in 1820 to 1860. So a 40-year period which is set between the Missouri Compromise and the start of the Civil War or the election of Abraham Lincoln, the secession of South Carolina. I know the war technically starts in 61, but this period between 1820 and 1860 is known as the antebellum period. And this period is characterized by sectionalism, all right, by this idea of these politicians who are chiefly promoting their sectional interest. And you still see sectionalism in U.S. politics today to an extent. Now, the North, the South, and the West each have their own economy, they have their political leaders, and they have their own political issues. So the North is characterized by emerging industry, while the South continues to be agricultural, just like it has been since day one. The West is an agricultural economy, but it is also a developing economy. So when you think about it, it's a frontier, it needs roads, bridges, canals, wants some help from the federal government developing that, whereas the South doesn't need that as much, nor does the South need promotion of industry, really. As far as political leaders, Daniel Webster is the most noteworthy political leader of the North at that time. John C. Calhoun from the South. We don't live too far away from where John C. Calhoun lived here in, in Clemson. And Henry Clay in the West. So this is what some historians call the age of Webster, Clay, and Calhoun. And as far as political issues, in the North, they tended to be anti-slavery. Now, not necessarily abolitionist, but not friendly to the interest of slaveholders. And they tended to be for a tariff because this went along with the industry that was developing in the North, all right? So in, as far as supporting industrial development, the North wanted a high tariff to cut down on competition from other countries. Now, meanwhile, the South tended to be pro-slavery. Tended would be an understatement, I guess. And then they were anti-tariff because their economy counted on growing agricultural products and exporting those and trading with other countries. So they wanted the tariff low for that reason. So slavery and the tariff were really two of your biggest issues during this time. And then in the West, the additional issue of economic development. Now, depending on whether it was the Northwest or the Southwest, that's going to depend on how big of an issue like slavery is or something like that. But in the West, what is the federal government going to do for the sake of economic development? And Henry Clay, of course, is going to come up with the American system, which is going to be popular in the North and somewhat popular in the West. That's going to be about a Hamiltonian program of internal improvements, Protective Tariff, National Bank. Actually, I usually do that in the NIP format. But anyway, that sectionalism there. The South, of course, is going to be against the American system. Now, as far as just a quick review of antebellum reform, okay, keep in mind that the antebellum reform movement starts with the Second Great Awakening, where we have this religious revival. Now, one of the biggest things about the Second Great Awakening is an increase in the number of Baptists and Methodists, which also saw an increase in the First Great Awakening, but especially the Second. And in the South especially, most people, as far as their religious denominations, Baptists and Methodists are both very, very common. Of course, if you go back to the Revolution, you would have seen the Church of England, as far as those people who even were religious. So two very big denominations that outside the United States aren't really major denominations for the most part. And abolitionism. Now you need to know William Lloyd Garrison. You could also run across Frederick Douglass, who was another abolitionist. So Garrison, he had his newspaper, The Liberator, but I think Garrison is a great one to know for that. And this is the anti-slavery movement. The idea that we get rid of slavery everywhere, 
We do it now, and we do it because it is the right thing to do. Slavery is wrong, and it should be gotten rid of because of that, pragmatic concerns aside. Now, of course, we'll talk later about the difference between abolitionism and free soil, but that's for another segment. We're looking specifically at reform movements right now. As far as the temperance movement, the temperance movement, this was an anti-alcohol campaign that they wanted to ban alcohol. And keep in mind that once again, we see American religious forces. We see that the Second Great Awakening is creating religious movements that are uniquely American. You see abolitionism. You see the temperance movement. These are things that are you know, very much ingrained in American society, you know, outside of the United States. Uh, you don't really see necessarily a, you know, a connection between being of the Christian religion and abstaining from alcohol. Whereas in the United States, there are lots of religious denominations that abstain from alcohol as part of their either teaching or just their general practice. And as far as women's rights, Elizabeth Cady Stanton would be a good person to remember. Also, Lucretia Mott, most of you would know Susan B. Anthony. These could come up. And of course, women's rights is about predominantly at this time during the antebellum period that women should vote. And this is, you know, really the defining moment here is the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. You might want to note that in your information about women's rights, uh, the Seneca Falls Convention in 1848. Okay, so there's William Lloyd Garrison. Remember his newspaper, The Liberator. Might want to make a note about that just in case you see something there. And he ran that from 1831 to 1865 in Massachusetts. Now, 1865, once the 13th Amendment is passed, William Lloyd Garrison, peace out. I'm done. I had something I wanted to do. I've done it. I'm going to retire now. And there's the masthead of The Liberator where we can see that it is really a religious calling, that the source of these reform movements is the Second Great Awakening. And keep in mind that reform movements are strongest in the North, weakest in the South. And this is, today when you think about it, the South still tends to be more conservative than a lot of areas of the country. So these reform movements were very progressive for the time that they were in. And another thing that we need to keep in mind, is that while these reform movements are very popular in the North, and especially when, or more popular than in the South, but when you hear Northerners that are saying that slavery is wrong, the South is wrong. Now, those of you that have grown up in the South, which would be a lot of you, you know that when you tell a Southerner they are wrong, you just made them more right. And because of that, the harder the North pushed, the harder the South pushed back. And what you're going to see is a departure from Jefferson's wolf by the ear sort of mentality that we don't really have a choice when it comes to slavery, that we're stuck with it. You start to see the positive defense of slavery from people like Calhoun, people who say that, hey, slavery is actually a good thing for everybody, and that is the proper station of the black race. So these sorts of things that are said by Southerners are really said in a lot of times in response to Northern criticism. So hard in the North push, South pushes back. For every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. And that takes us through Standard 2, and we will be going on to Standard 3, looking at the causes of the Civil War in just a moment. So hopefully you'll go on with us to the next segment. See you in a bit.